Mid-1944. Despite the defeats suffered in recent months, the Third Reich continues to occupy a good part of Europe, from the French Atlantic coast to a good part of Western Russia. However, regarding the military factor, the balance had long ago tipped in the direction of the Allies. One of the last hopes of the German high command during that year was to resist the foreseeable Anglo-American landing in France and the new major offensive that the Soviets were capable of launching on the Eastern Front. If they achieved at least one of these objectives, there would still be some chance of not losing the war. The Normandy landings took place on June 6, 1944, and after three months of fierce fighting, the Germans were expelled from France. On the other hand, Operation Bagration, launched by the Soviets just a few days later during that same month of June, annihilated most of the German troops that were still in Russian territory. From this point, in which it seemed that the end had arrived for Germany, the Wehrmacht continued to fight with a ferocity never seen before, surpassing any type of limit, which led to its annihilation. Next, in this program, we are going to analyze what were the seven reasons that made the German soldier continue fighting, after all hope of victory had disappeared. Let's start with a curious conversation that took place at the beginning of April 1945, between Generals Henrici and Bussy. A few days before the Soviet offensive against Berlin began, Bussy, commander of the German 9th Army, told Henrici the following. My intention is to resist on the Oder front long enough, until the Americans reach Berlin. If we can be capable of such action, we will have fulfilled our mission before our people, our country, and history. Then Henrici, surprised, asked him the following. Haven't you heard about the Eclipse plan? The general of the 9th Army told him no. Henrici then proceeded to explain the content of said document that they had captured a few months ago, during the offensive in the Ardennes, which showed how Germany was going to be divided up. It should be noted that this document was totally confidential, and Henrici had had access to it through General Jadl. In summary, what Henrici came to tell Bussy was that it did not matter exactly if the Soviets were managed to retain the odor, because in the end, the areas of occupation were already established, and half of Germany was going to end up falling under the hands of Soviets inevitably. In any case, this intention to delay the Red Army for as long as possible, so that Germany would be occupied by the Americans and British, was an intention that all the generals had who had not had access to this secret information. This was undoubtedly one of the most important reasons, that motivated the troops of the Eastern Front to fight until their last breath. As point number two on the program, we have the death of American President Roosevelt. German propaganda fed its troops and its population with the idea that the hardships had to be endured a little longer, because the Allied bloc was about to fragment. There was no doubt that it was an unnatural alliance. This was intended for the troops to fight for a longer time, waiting for their enemies to fight among themselves, and then they could ally themselves with the Americans. This last hope was very present during the final battle for Berlin, and there were two events that reinforced it. Firstly, we have the death of American President Roosevelt, with which it was expected that the Allied bloc would finish fragmenting. This occurred just a few days before Soviet troops entered the German capital. The other action was precisely a raid by American aircraft on Berlin on the night of April 23, in which no bomb was dropped. This event was used to sell that the alliance between the United States and Germany was going to arrive in a few hours. Finally, there was also an allusion to the fact that a large army of the Western Allies was heading to Berlin to save them from the Soviets. As a curiosity, when the war ended, one of the German generals, completely convinced that this union would be possible, told his American interrogators the following. I offer my services to raise a division of some 23,000 members from your current Waffen SS prisoners. This unit will be called SS Europe Division and will be equipped with German weapons and equipment. I will have no difficulty in enlisting men necessary for that unit to take part in the fight against Russia. Then, we will show them how the Germans fight. The general in question was Kurt Meyer, former commander-in-chief of the hitler jugen division, and his proposal was rejected. In any case, there is no doubt that if the Soviet Union and the United States had gone to war in 1945 or 1946, these men would have been drafted again.
The third point alludes to one of the phrases that was repeated among German soldiers over and over again. The phrase said that peace would be much worse than war. By September 1944, after the expulsion of the Germans from France and the arrival of the Russians in Warsaw, it was clear to everyone that the Third Reich was not going to win the war. With Roosevelt's statement at the beginning of 1943, in which he insisted that he would only accept Germany's unconditional surrender, it was also more than clear what the fate of the Germans would be when the war ended. Because of this, there are numerous statements from Wehrmacht soldiers with the following statement. I would rather die on the battlefield defending my country, than spend the rest of my life cutting down trees in Canada or Siberia. These allied intentions of not accepting anything other than unconditional surrender, with a foreseeable occupation of Germany for decades, were fully exploited by German propaganda itself to motivate its troops to fight until the end. For practical purposes, it is like cornering a very dangerous injured animal, which is left with no escape other than to continue fighting for its life. In short, the key idea here is that they could either fight and try to save the situation, or live out the rest of their days in slave-like conditions in Siberia or elsewhere. In an attempt to change the Germans' minds, Soviet propaganda made numerous efforts during the final campaigns of the war to make the Germans believe that they would be treated well if captured by them. With this action, they obviously intended for the Germans to stop putting up such fierce resistance. As point four, we have the promise that was made to the frontline soldiers, as well as the generals themselves, that the new miraculous weapons were coming, and that with them they could finally win the war. Jet planes that would regain control of the skies. New monstrous tanks would stop any enemy offensive on the ground, and new missiles would devastate the Allied capitals, forcing them to surrender. These main weapons, along with other lower-level ones, motivated many soldiers to continue fighting in the hope of a radical turn of events. Fifthly, and no less important, we have the slogan with which the troops were bombed, which indicated that Germany's enemies were on the verge of collapse. They had all seen the high number of Soviet casualties and the unprecedented waste of material by the Americans. The question they asked themselves was, how long their enemies would be able to continue maintaining that rate of resource expenditure. When many German soldiers began to fall prisoner to the Americans and British in France, the Germans were surprised to be told that New York was not completely in ruins, as their propaganda had told them. In summary, the slogan was that they had to resist a little more, since their enemies were also on the verge of collapse. As point number six, we have one of the most important of all, if not directly the most. The extreme resistance to defend their own families. When in early 1945 the Allies reached Germany's original borders, whether on the Rhine or East Prussia, what was at stake was no longer a withdrawal from territory previously conquered in France or the Soviet Union, but rather they were directly its cities that were in danger. Furthermore, they were all aware of the abuses that would await their families if their enemies finally reached them, and it was directly for them that they fought. In any case, and so that they would not forget, the German leader sent the following statement to his troops just at the moment in which the Soviets launched their final assault on April 16. Soldiers of the Eastern Front, for the last time, the deadly Bolshevik enemy goes on the attack with its hordes. He intends to destroy Germany and exterminate our people. You, soldiers of the East, already know the fate that threatens German women, girls, and children. The old people and children will be killed, the women and girls will be turned into camp prostitutes, the rest will go to Siberia. Although the harangue is much longer, it finally ends as follows. In these hours, the entire German people are watching over you, my warriors. In the East, I only hope that thanks to your perseverance, your fanaticism, and your weapons, the Bolshevik avalanche is drowned in its own blood. The last point of the program focuses on the way of being of a society like Germany. When German fighters, regardless of their rank, were captured and asked why they continued to fight this way even when all was lost, many of their answers were simply that this was what they had been ordered to do. It is my duty as a soldier to continue fighting until my superiors tell me otherwise, many responded. Well, what do you think? Which of these points do you give more importance to? 
Do you think the war would have ended sooner if the Allies had proposed another alternative to unconditional surrender? I leave you in the description the program we made about all the battles of 1945, so you can see at what level fighting continued when the outcome of the war was decided.